pretty inspiring, isn't it? When we look at and when we listen to the things that you just heard, there's a theme, and the theme is one that may not be apparent right away. They talked about health. They talked about innovation. They talked about care. We talked about adherence. We talked about mobility. But underneath all of that is one very simple and very, very important concept. Time. Because time is precious. If you have waited for a loved one to get well, if you waited or hoped for another day, another hour, another year with a loved one, there is nothing more precious than time. You also heard that it takes a long time to bring life science innovation forward. You heard that the regular, regulatory pathway takes a long time to make sure that treatments are safe and effective and that we can pay for them. Time is precious. To move things forward faster takes money. It's the old seesaw, right? And we all know it in whatever business we have. If I have more money, I can add more people on a big project and it takes less time. If I have less money, I move slowly. I don't move as quickly. That's why Mayor Lane had the foresight to go to California and to meet with leaders and to meet Jonathan Fleming. That's why leaders across the state of Arizona are all working together, not just life science leaders, but leaders from almost every industry to address the issue of access to capital. That's why um, see, next week we will see the CEO of a company that was born, developed, and exited here in Arizona for $600 million on stage with a member of the board of directors of CVS Health and one of the leading researchers in the state, Dr. Du Bois, right up the, just up Scottsdale Road from here, talking about the importance of access to capital. We don't have enough here, which means that those companies that you heard from, those researchers that, that Tom Savsbury talked about, spent a lot of time on airplanes chasing money. And when they say, you know, we need your support, what they're really saying is, we need your money. Because time is money. And the innovation that comes forward may make the difference in more time for that person that you love in the future. So with that, I want to give you just a little bit of insight on our keynote speaker. So Jonathan Fleming is the president and treasurer of NEHI, um, which is the Network for Excellence in Health Innovation. Jonathan's been in the venture capital world for almost three decades. In fact, three decades, okay, <laughs> it turned over. When you look at the road from discovery to development to delivery, it's like medicine. It's not an exact science. It is a practice. And you're about to hear from one of the leading practitioners in what it takes to understand how to fund life-saving and life-changing innovations along the path from discovery to development to delivery. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jonathan Fleming.
Good afternoon, Scottsdale. Mayor Lane, uh, members of the City Council, it has been um, really just a pleasure to get to know your city and in particular to get to know some of the people in your city. Um, I feel like after an introduction like that, I had to just sit down and um, kind of think about it. But the um, fact is the mayor did call me several weeks ago and uh, he wanted to talk to me about this speech. And uh, I thought that was pretty different and pretty interesting. Typically the mayor doesn't come and, and call you up and tell you what he wants you to talk about. And so I thought he was going to talk to me about economic development and things that you know, he should do to promote economic development. And I started talking about maybe taking care of people. And he said, no, John, and that's not what I want you to talk about. He said, what I care about are cures. I want my city, my region, to be engaged in finding cures for people. I have to tell you, I really um, puzzled over that quite a bit. I didn't really know what the mayor meant, and I didn't really know how I could bring that home to you. And then uh, two or three weeks ago, I got a call from a friend of mine about her daughter named Jenny. Jenny is somebody that I watched from little tiny babyhood grow up and play with my daughter. And when she was in high school, she had a lot of interest in life science innovation, and I arranged for her to work as an intern in several of our biotechnology companies and Jenny got very inspired about curing people and she went on to medical school at Tufts and uh, was serving her residency when things began to go wrong and two weeks ago she got one of the cruelest, most unfair diagnoses that I can possibly imagine. So Mayor, I, um, I know now what you were talking about. Because every one of us who cares about somebody, who loves somebody, has had that experience that I've had at that moment saying, doggone it, we have to find a cure. This cannot go on. I do not accept this. I want to find a cure. So today, this speech is a little bit dedicated to you, Mr. Mayor, and a little bit dedicated to my friend Jenny. So. What I want to talk about a little bit is uh, just a few minutes about Nehi because I think it's one of the most important things that we've done in Massachusetts um, to form this network and others like it. It's a key reason why cures and innovation happen as much as they do in um, the state of Massachusetts and the region of Boston. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about where I think cures are occurring, where they're not occurring, and then maybe what you can do here in Scottsdale and, uh, and personally about all of that. So the um, first thing I wanted to do, you heard that I've been a venture capitalist for 30 years, and that's true. I also have a personal history with, with cancer. So in my particular case, my mother died of uh, breast cancer when uh, I was six years old. One of the interesting things about the human brain is that um, it copes with tragedy, in my case, by uh, not allowing me to have a single memory of her or of my life before the age of seven. Sort of an interesting phenomenon, but it speaks to me of whatever the pain was of, of losing your mother at that age. And then uh, eight years ago, I was myself diagnosed with a melanoma, and thanks to the skill of the surgeons at the Massachusetts General Hospital, I have passed my five-year mark and now stand here before you as somebody who is cured of cancer. And so I've uh, worked in the venture capital industry for 30 years. I've worked um, teaching for the last 12 years, and I've worked for 32 years across the entire world trying to help individuals, trying to help companies, trying to help regions figure out how we can create more cures. And that's what I'm going to try to bring forward to you today. So Nehi was actually created by the CEO of the Massachusetts General Hospital, I think still ranked the number one hospital in the world, CEO of the Harvard Medical School, CEO of the local insurance company, and the CEO of one of the local biotechnology companies. And they were all working in their silos on their individual problems, much like the wonderful companies that you saw up here. And they said whether it's government policy or whether it's attracting the venture capital 
or whether it's just creating the infrastructure and the education that we need to produce the workers that we need, we actually have to pull together and form a network that is dedicated to healthcare innovation. And originally that network existed only in Boston, then it existed in the state, now it exists across the country, and uh, before I'm done, it's going to exist across the world. What makes us special is that our network consists of members that are part of every piece of the healthcare um, ecosystem. So you'll see health plans, you'll see the professional services, the IT, the pharma guys, the hospital, the patient consumer groups, the employers in medical technology, and you'll see pharmacy. And you here in Scottsdale have no idea how lucky you are to have such a strong presence represented by CVS Health, one of the most progressive companies in America today. And without their CEO and CMO, Troy Brennan, CEO is Larry Merlo, CMO is Troy Brennan, um, these, these people are leading the way for the rest of us, and you are so fortunate to have such a strong presence of CVS here in your region, and they will definitely be part of the solution. How do our programs work? So we actually do do research, whether it's on policies that um, governments can change to make things work better, or that hospitals can change to make patients work better, or that we can change in our IT system. And then we convene all of the players in a room, including the government, and we educate them about what they need to do and, uh, and help them move forward to do that. And no, Mayor Lane, this is not something that you have to pay for out of the city budget. Um, this is something that we go to these very fine um, foundations to support our work and, uh, and actually generate the data that supports the positions that we're trying to advocate for. So our policy agenda is, first of all, just improving the delivery. Um, I think you saw some fabulous examples of trying to get delivery out of the hospital into the neighborhood, into the home, to where the patient lives. An enormous amount of the problem we have in healthcare today is just ensuring that people use the medicines that we have. We can affect many more cures of people that we love and care about if we can just get them to take their medicines properly. And um, as evidence, the CVS is actually one of the leaders in, uh, in bringing not so much inventing the technology, but in bringing the inventions and the innovations that are occurring around our country and focusing them on the individual patient. We have to change the way that we pay for things because a lot of the things that are being invented that are so cool, they cost a lot of money. And we're gonna have to figure out as a society how to pay for that innovation now when the benefits, just as you saw in that CVS slide, actually occur over an extended period of time. And we do care a lot about technology, and we really believe that cures come when you have actually a holistic approach to wellness and that your community has um, a strong program advocating healthy lifestyles, healthy living, and, uh, and taking care of illness when it pops up. So that's knee high. So the next question I wanted to ask myself is, are we making progress? I was thinking about this uh, mandate that I had now that I had figured out what the mayor wanted me to talk about, and I said, well, are we making progress? Is, is the world better now than it was before? Newspaper came out a couple of days after I made this slide and said that actually this uh, last year we spent 17.5% of our GDP on healthcare. And uh, people are increasingly worried, like how much higher can it go? And I'm here to tell you in our lifetimes it's going to go a lot higher because these are the kinds of things that we're gonna to want to spend our money on. It's gonna be our health and our life and the quality of our life. But some of these new breakthrough drugs are costing a lot of unexpected dollars. It's created a lot of attention in the media and the politics about the cost of healthcare. It's definitely going to be an issue in the presidential campaign. And I guess I wanted as this part of my talk just to make a really simple point to you as you think about what we're spending which is this is not an apples to apples comparison. We are getting, because we've invested this money, a lot more healthcare. And that, that is translating, first of all, into a lot more years of life, and it's translating into a lot more quality of life. 
So I, um, I just went very quickly into uh, the government statistics that came upon this slide, which says that in 1970, um, if you were a guy, you had a life expectancy of either 60 or about 67 years of age. Um, and actually, if you extend this out, Today, uh, most of us, uh, people like me, could expect to live um, into our 80s. So we're getting 20 years more life just because we've been spending this money. So it's not, it's not an apples to apples comparison, it's really a comparison of living to 60, living to 80. You know, which way do you want to go? Interestingly here, and I, I know I'm in a region where there are a lot of uh, people with uh, Hispanic heritage, um, when you look at the same data for Hispanics, they top out um, across all uh, ethnic backgrounds. So the people who live the longest, male and female, um, actually turn out to be people with Hispanic backgrounds. I'm convinced it's either the music or the, or the food or, <laughs> um, or uh, in my case, uh, what I've decided is it's the tequila. And um, <laughs> so that's, that's the way that I translated that. But here's the, uh, here's the cancer that killed my mother. So if you look at the rate of incidence of this cancer, it's actually the same. It's more or less the same number of people, and it really doesn't matter what ethnic group you look at, it doesn't really matter what age you look at. Um, lots and lots and lots and lots of women come down with a diagnosis of breast cancer every year. But here's the wonderful news. Look at those death rates heading straight down. So this turns out to be, Mr. Mayor, an area where we do have cures. Um, there are going to be, uh, or there were, I guess we're still in 2015, 231,840 cases of breast cancer diagnosed in the country. How they got that before we finished the year, I don't know, but they did. It's about 14% of all cancer cases, but they're not going to be 230,000 deaths. We're going to be about 40,000 deaths this year, only about 7% of all cancer deaths. And here's the part that I love. That's why I put that little graphic up there with all the people. Nine out of 10 of the women who get this diagnosis, and there are those women in my family too, are going to live. They're going to live. That is a cure. When you live for five years or longer, at least by the way we define things today, you are cured. If my mother had the same diagnosis that killed her in 1964, she would be alive today and I would remember her. I'd like to talk a little bit about my friend Pete. Pete is the boyfriend of my mother-in-law. Pete's job is to keep mother-in-law happy. When mother-in-law is happy, <laughs> wife is happy. Wife is happy, I'm happy. So. Pete loves to go on cruise ships. They love to go to the casinos. Foxwood lives off these guys. They hit the restaurants. They love the New England Patriots on their way to their next Super Bowl. Thank you very much. And he loves to spend time with his family. So I remember a time about 10, 12 years ago when Pete wanted to take his own life. The reason he wanted to take his own life is because he couldn't do the things that he used to be able to do. And then he went to the hospital and he got not one, but two new artificial knees. And imagine my humiliation when we pushed the windsurfer out on the lake and the 80-something-year-old man all of a sudden hops uh, back onto the windsurfer and sails away. So because of that very simple healthcare innovation of two new knees, he is actually living the lifestyle where this dude can windsurf better than I can. And um, so he, in addition to his artificial knees, he has numerous stents in his heart. There's probably not a vein or artery in his heart that's not held open with metal. His teeth, his hearing aids, his glasses. Um, you know, whenever he goes anywhere, the litany is, did you take this? Did you remember this? Did you turn on your hearing aids? Do they have batteries? Are your teeth in? Um, and he takes a lot of different pills. But Pete's a happy guy, right? So we do spend money on Pete. But Pete has a very high quality of life. He makes other people very happy. And he supports the economy. So innovation can also mean um, spare parts. It can mean, um, <laughs> it can mean just keeping Pete around. Um, I won't talk about the little blue pill either. But the, um, <laughs> he did pull me aside one day and said, he said, thank you guys for inventing that thing. I really like that. But, um, <laughs> 
So here's, here's the cancer that could have killed me. So this is a really interesting cancer because if it does break into, if it does metastasize into your bloodstream, as you can see from the statistics up there, your odds are not good. So when you get the call from your, your uh, in this case it was a dermatologist who took the biopsy, it says you have this um, cancer, it is aggressive and it is malignant and um, we're going to be doing these surgeries. I sort of vaguely knew these statistics, which is if, in fact, they got this thing before it escaped into the rest of my body, I had a really, really great chance of standing in front of you today. But if I had been too late, until very, very recently, my odds were basically zero. Now, fortunately, as a result of uh, new pharmaceuticals coming from both Bristol-Myers Squibb and Merck, people who do have this unfortunate situation where their cancer has metastasized are now able to have some truly miraculous cures. And so if you go back to that feeling of, wow, this person I, I love or I care about has got this diagnosis and it's really, really bad, in the last couple of years, there have been some families where they've had that cure. Like they, they looked up and they wished or they prayed and it happened. And, and that is because these two companies brought these two drugs to market. The message that I wanted to give you with this slide is please go get checked. So I get checked every 90 days. You live in a state where, as far as I can tell, the sun shines every single day. In Boston, I don't have to worry about that as much. Um, but here you do. And um, this very deadly cancer, and you can be in charge of your own cure if you show up and you get yourself checked. What was interesting about this is it was not the, um, the doctor who found the, uh, the cancer on my arm. It was actually my wife. So we were kayaking along somewhere, and she looked over at my forearm, and she said, I don't like that. Go get that checked. They said, no, oh, it's just at the doctor. He looked at it. It was fine. She said, I don't care. You know, I, you know you're, you're important to me. You're going to go back to him and have him biopsy that. And thank goodness that she did. So one of the most important things you can do as a community when you want to promote cures is promote education about things that people can do in their own lives to take charge of their own health. And one of them is screening. And if you live in a state where the sun shines every day, every single person in your family ought to know something, a little something at least, about melanoma. So that was the good news. Here's the bad news. Um, this, ladies and gentlemen, is mostly where I'm going to be spending the rest of my career, um, either as a venture capitalist or as an entrepreneur or as someone working to promote new cures. So pretty much anything having to do with the brain today is um, an unexplored frontier that we know very little about. In my 30-year career for Alzheimer's, despite trying with a number of different people, there are no new cures for Alzheimer's. There are no new cures for Parkinson's. There are no new cures for ALS. There hasn't really been an exciting new cure or method of treating depression since 1986 when Prozac came out. Schizophrenia, ditto. I don't have to talk to you in this state about the impact in your community of uh, deaths from opioid addiction. Uh, we have an extraordinary need in our country to find new means of treating pain that are non-addictive, and of course, the, uh, the tragedy of autism. So in all of these areas, your work here is not yet done. I think you had fabulous companies coming up here talking to you about their innovation, but your work is not yet done. All of you will have family members who will be impacted by these diseases, and all of us as a country must work harder than we have worked before to find new cures. Here's how we're going to get them. So you actually had, and I was really pleased, a couple of great examples of precision medicine, of using the individual's, individual patient's genetic profile to guide therapy. So if you think about it, when my mother was diagnosed in 1964, they just said she had breast cancer. I don't know of a hospital, I'm sure that's not true in Health Honors, where you go to someone you say you have breast cancer. You say you have a lesion of the breast characterized by the following genetic molecular profile. So today women are bucketed into at least nine different categories, triple negative, triple positive, or some mix of different receptors. 
and their therapy in every hospital in America is today predicated upon that genetic profile. So what I can tell you about some of those brain diseases is that this is not a single um, bug that causes Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. There's about 59 different ways, it turns out, that we found so far that you could become demented as you get older. I'm working on all of them. But the, um, but the point is the same techniques that we used in precision medicine to uh, make these cures happen in cancer, we're going, we're doing it now. We're taking the same approach and we're trying to genetically profile people, their brains or their diseases in their brains so that we can understand again, just as we have with breast cancer, the different buckets of types of patients and begin developing therapies that are precision directed towards them. The immune system modulators are in fact the drugs that I described from Merck or Bristol-Myers Squibb. And what these do is simply sort of take the break off your immune system. Our body is a marvelous balance of things that attack foreign bodies and things that know, hey, that's okay, don't attack that. And it's this really interesting system of checks and balances. If you have too much immune system uh, activity in your body, you get diseases that are called autoimmune diseases, things like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus. But what we've discovered with cancer patients is that we can take the brakes off the immune system for patients that we know are in trouble, and at least in 30 or 40 percent of the cases, we've had some remarkable cures from these immune system modulators. And now the, the race is on to try to figure out which patients are going to respond, which ones are not, and how can we invent new ones. Cell-based therapies involved taking some of your cells out of your body, taking them off and processing them and enriching them with um, some parts of the immune system that are specifically directed to your type of cancer and then infusing them back in your body. Again, at least in mice and rats, it looks really good. And the early results in patients are really exciting. You've read a lot about stem cells. You're going to be reading a lot more about stem cells in the years ahead. Today, they're used more as drug discovery tools. So companies that I'm involved with take stem cells from patients who have autism or ALS, just to pick two examples, and they grow up little tiny um, neuronal networks. Think of them as very primitive little brains, but they actually represent the brains of those individual patients. And then we can interrogate those little dishes of brains with um, different kinds of drugs to see if, in fact, we can discover things that would be used to treat these brain diseases. And of course, because in I can actually take a skin sample from any one of you, take it back to one of my friends in Boston, and we can take your skin and we can take one of those cells, we can bring it all the way back to a stem cell. Once we have it as a stem cell today, we can program it to make different body parts. So in the future, you are looking at a world in which we will make that kidney, make that liver, make that lung, make that body part that you need in order to cure you of something that is causing your disease. Ultimately, when you think about, in my case, our old Toyota that my son is still driving, he's trying to get it to 200,000 miles, and we keep changing out certain parts, new tires, new air filter, new this or that, we're all living a longer and longer time. And at least one source of successful investments I've made has just been in the spare parts to replace the things that just wear out over time. So stem cells are going to be very important there. So gene therapy is a topic. It's actually I created, helped create the first gene therapy company back in 1988. And all we learned was how much we didn't know. But in 30 years, we've learned an awful lot. And one of the things we've learned is that if we're going to defeat muscular dystrophy, or other diseases where the, it's basically each cell in the body is affected by this genetic defect. Without going back and changing the underlying genetic structure, we actually have to use a viral vector and infect every single gene, every single cell in your body with a better version of a genome that makes, in this case, the protein that lets these boys grow up and have normal lives. So those gene therapy trials are now happening all across the United States. And I think you're going to see the first approvals for the first gene therapy drugs um, in the next couple of years. And then finally, uh, something 
that uh, man is capable of inventing as great as nuclear power and its potential, and as great as nuclear power and its potential to do harm has been invented. It does exist, and it does work. And that is the ability to go into an embryo and to edit the genes of that embryo. So we know an awful lot now about which genes, when they're not um, arranged in a certain way, lead to certain diseases. Technique was invented simultaneously at the University of California, Berkeley, and out in Boston called CRISPR-Cas9, which can literally go in and, um, and edit that genome. So at first people thought, well, this is really terrific. We're going to be able to take this Duchenne's muscular dystrophy boy. We actually know a lot about that gene, or Angela Jolie's BRCA1 gene, and we'll just fix it. We can fix it while they're still in utero. What's wrong with that? What if you decided that, you know, you didn't like red hair, you wanted black hair? We can change that too. The kid is too short, or we can make him taller. So the, the, as you can see, the ethical and moral implications of this technology are at least as profound as nuclear power. They get fundamentally as what are we as human beings. And literally this week there has been a gathering of the top scientists of the United States of America China and Europe, and they are forging an agreement amongst themselves that they will hold, put a moratorium on the development of this technology in human beings for at least a little while until we sort out what are the rules going to be for doing this? Because you could imagine that in the right hands, it's a tremendous technology for good. It is, Mayor Lane, the ultimate source of cures. Um, because you can fix somebody so that not only do they grow up um, perfectly normal, but their children and their children's children will carry that same gene fix all the way through. So this is really, these suite of technologies are going to be the basis of the cures going forward. If you are having this event in the next five or 10 years, you will be talking about all of them. And if you want to be a place where cures occur, it's going to have to be using many of these things to go after those diseases that I talked about. Here is the innovation cycle. Christian in particular wanted me to talk about money. And so this is the part of the um, uh, talk that talks about money. Um, research is principally coming from the US government. A little bit comes from the states. <clears throat> Most of the discovery actually does occur in our research institutions around the country. Um, the really tricky part and the part you need to work on here in Scottsdale that we work very hard on in Boston is called translation, which is taking the discovery out of the lab and creating a company or a project around it that actually develops a product. The development, it sounds like something that you are pretty good at here, which is actually doing the clinical trials of the product to see if it works, and there's a standard of care. So if you're going to do this in Scottsdale, if you're going to attract people like me to come into your community and invest in your companies, you are going to need to produce a highly educated workforce that understands not just at the PhD level how to work um, these technologies, but at the bachelor level or even the high school graduate level, there are many, many, many positions in companies and in hospitals that with a high school degree and one or two years of training can make you a hugely um, value-adding worker. Think of all the ultrasound techs, MRI techs, lab techs that um, infiltrate our system. In Boston, um, people pay a lot of attention to Harvard and MIT, but they do not pay enough attention to the fact that we have phenomenal nursing schools. We take kids who don't have high school degrees and we teach them how to be our ultrasound techs or our MRI techs or our x-ray techs. So there is a role for everybody in our healthcare system. The networks I've talked about, I'll talk about again. In Boston and in San Francisco, the places that you're fundamentally competing about, the people at the top have formed formal and informal networks and they get together and they talk and they go to the mayor, not as individuals, they go to the governor, not as individuals, they go as a community and they say, we need this to change. And they typically get a lot of attention. You need entrepreneurs. I'm going to come back to that uh, one more time. You obviously need risk capital and, um, and you need leadership. But if you get this cycle to work, you get the high paying jobs, the healthy community, the economic growth, and yes, you do get cures. What drives this money cycle? Well, first of all, it's a lot of money. 
I was just looking up the, uh, my favorite venture capital statistics, and just in the last quarter, there was $3 billion invested by people like me in the life sciences sector alone. If you look at um, the statistics, that's about 17% of all formal venture capital. Um, venture firms have, in fact, invested almost $50 billion as a group um, in the United States. Um, but less than 20% of that actually goes to the life sciences. But the last bullet is the most important. These figures do not include investments by angel investors. So I personally, in addition to managing other people's money, have somewhere between 15 and 20 personal investments in startup life science companies, almost all of them in the Boston area. And with me are lots of other people that look just like me. They're people who've either made their money in healthcare or made their money as being entrepreneurs. They want to give back to the community. And they are a much larger source, it turns out, of the seed startup capital than the venture community, which puts in a lot of numbers, but if you actually looked at the number of companies underlying all that money, it's pretty small. And if you want to understand where a lot of the companies, at least in my hometown, come from, there's, they start with these angel investors. We do also have a state fund that supports our companies. The state actually doesn't get to decide how to um, give out the money. They hired a bunch of venture capitalists who work for them for free, and we help them allocate the money. And then finally, the strategic corporate venture funds are, are critically important. What drives all of this money cycle is actually policy, policy made mostly by governments, and that includes the research spending policy, the FDA policies, the drug prices, patent law policies, all of these things include the total amount of money that gets spent. How you get it into here into Scottsdale is going to be when people perceive, like me, that this is an area they can fly into and meet multiple companies that they would like to invest in. So what can Scottsdale do? Well, the first thing and the most important thing, it's why I'm here from Nehi, is to form leadership networks. I cannot emphasize this enough, how many times and how many venues the leaders of the hospitals, of the companies, of the money, the venture capitalists get together in a room and say, what's working, what's not? What can I do for you? What can you do for me? How can we help each other? Secondly, I'd like you to really focus on educating your workforce across all of the health professions, nurses, techs, obviously the molecular biologists, the geneticists, but there's actually a role for everybody in your community in this healthcare economy. You're going to have to attract and support entrepreneurs, and quite honestly, that's going to make you very uncomfortable at times. Entrepreneurs are not nice people. They are not. They're very difficult to work with. They are change agents. They are people who fundamentally look at this and, and reject it. They say, no, things are not right. No, I don't agree that everything is rosy. I want to change it. And change is hard. Just ask Theranos. <laughs> give you. It's really, really hard to be disruptive. You make a lot more enemies than friends. If you're going to do this, you have to be a place where educated and successful people want to live. As based on what I've seen, you have a fantastic quality of life here and um, you will have to just keep building on that to be a place where not only people who want to recreate, but highly educated people feel that they also have a place to live, promote healthy lifestyles, patient engagement. And then finally, I think I've gotten this message across by some of the people in front of me, you're going to have to teach and discuss genomics in your community because as individuals or as a community, you will have to understand this and quite honestly, Reading it about it in the newspaper, most of what you read is wrong. They tend to sort of simplify it, and it's a very complicated subject because we tend to think that there's a normal and an abnormal. But if you look at this room, we're all different. So who of us gets to be the normal one, and then everybody else is abnormal? Is it the mayor? Is like he the normal guy? And we're all like, if you're one standard deviation away from the mayor, then you're not normal? What is normal? Well, it turns out we're six billion different individuals. All of us work slightly differently. And so when you hear people say, we're going to have to analyze your genome and figure it out, they've got it right. So that's already happening here. And my plea to you is pay attention to that 
and whether you're supporting the company or supporting it in your family or in your community. I'll just give you one more example of that. Because my mother um, died when she did, both of my daughters um, had their, they didn't have their whole genome sequence, but there are 28 key genes that if you have them put you at a very high risk for breast cancer. So um, we actually had them sequenced. And then we waited until the envelope came. Um, fortunately, it was good news. But if they had had a different outcome, we would be managing their health care differently. Perhaps not as extreme as Angelina Jolie, but they would start their mammograms like at 25 or 30. Um, we'd be paying a lot of attention to them to make sure that we caught it early. So teaching and discussing genomics in your own family and in your community is a key part of finding a cure. And I just want to come back one more time to the entrepreneur thing. Um, when I first did this slide, I had dozens of people that I've worked with, all of whom came from outside our country, and um, all of whom have made enormous contributions to our country. So in Boston, we are incredibly pro-immigration. Um, we could not run our economy without it. And it's people like Michael, Eric, Andre, or Akshay who, in fact, come to our area to study or to work, stay, and start companies. In the case of Eric, he was kicked out of Austria when he was eight or nine, came to the United States. He's won the Nobel Prize for figuring out how memory works in the brain, started two companies that it was my honor to be the chairman of. But um, I could tell you a story. Uh, Michael came from South Africa, Eric from Austria, Andre from Mexico, actually from uh, Canada, actually, um, and uh, many, many, many more. And um, part of building the Cures Quarter is going to be convincing people that Scottsdale is a place where people like this want to live, want to raise their families, want to start their companies, want to be part of this really amazing adventure that you've started out on. So finally, what can you do? Well, first of all, you have to get engaged in your own health. I think there were some great examples of how that can happen. Um, but you have to pay attention and understand that you are responsible for where you are. And if you want something to change, you will have to change it. The second thing I have to tell you is not so much fun, it's exercise. So about 14 years ago, I did a company out in San Diego with a very famous professor who had discovered the way that brains grow new brain cells. So it turns out, any of you who were taught that um, you know, all your brain cells are formed when you're young, and then that's it, and if you have as much tequila as I had as a kid, like you were, I liked to kill them all, um, turns out that's wrong. Turns out every day until the rest of your life, you do, perhaps at a reduced rate, create new brain cells in your brain, and uh, when you're injured or uh, when you're taking a drug for depression, the way that it works is it actually stimulates the growth of new brain cells. So this professor had wired up a bunch of mice and rats, and he had looked at all the different ways that you can um, stimulate the growth of brain cells as a treatment for depression. So, you know, he tested food, he tested chocolate, he got this huge grant from Mars, and uh, he really wanted to prove that chocolate was the, uh, was the way to go. Um, he looked at uh, high social environments, you know, he, you know, if you really had a very active sexual life, did that help? He, he basically checked out everything. And unfortunately, uh, what uh, proved, at least in mice, is that if you put an exercise wheel in their cage, um, it beats every other thing they can do. So this exercise thing that you heard about, all of us being runners, it's not just about looking good and it's not just about, well, maybe this will help me avoid diabetes. It actually turns out that the single best thing you can do for the health of your brain, which is the thing that I'm working on, is exercise. So, Please go out and exercise. Last time I looked, Scottsdale has an ideal infrastructure to go um, exercise and play. I've talked about preventive care. I've talked about genomics. And the last thing is evidenced by your presence listening to me today to embrace and support innovation and the people who produce it. And so if you are business people, that means that you do need to go out and support these companies as angel investors. You do need to help them make connections. And uh, you do need to work with the mayor to recruit the next set of entrepreneurs and innovators to come into a community and uh, give them the same unbelievably warm welcome and, uh, and just real, uh, really exciting presentation that I received from all of you. 
So thank you for listening and your attention. I'm really excited to see this Cures Quarter develop over the years ahead. I really hope that in addition to the amazing work that you're doing in cancer and some of these other areas, that you also develop cures in the areas that we need the most, which I've outlined. And um, thank you again for your attention and support. Thank you so very much, Jonathan. It's been a pleasure to have you here and uh, just a wonderful presentation and certainly appreciate all the compliments about our fine city and the things that we're attempting to do here with the Cure Carter and your endorsement there of that mi mission. So thanks so very much. And really, on behalf of all of the speakers who have been with us today and Mr. Fleming as well, please let's give another round of applause. I'd like to once again thank our sponsors. Again, this is what made it all possible, and we very much appreciate their participation on that level as well. I'd ask that you go to scottsdalecurecorridor.com if you need any additional information or you want to see some follow-up on this, uh, this meeting here today. So please go ahead and do that. And I just wish, in closing, wish you all the very best for the rest of your day and hope to see you here again next year. <laughs>